Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming today. I'm really excited to see the number of participants growing each week. This is our third session and I'm really excited that, you know, this many people are here and that people are coming back. Today we are joined by a Microsofty, Emily Killian, who will be, uh, she's a senior software engineer and she's actually my mentor this summer. Um, and she has had a lot of experience interviewing people. So um, today's setup is gonna be a little bit different. Instead of interviewing me, we're gonna be doing um, two interviews, one with Eddie Zhu and one with Fouad Ali. And we're gonna do the same problem. Um, and the first one will be a quote bad interview and then the second one will be a good interview. So we can see what the difference between those two would look like. This is not actually affiliated with any company. That said, I'm gonna hand it over to, to Emily. Hey folks, yeah, so I'm Emily Killian. Um, I'm an employee of Microsoft. I wanna state right up front, um, as Julia said, this is not affiliated with any company though. All the opinions here are just mine um, from the last few years. So to give a little background on myself, um, I graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2013. Um, I got a triple major in math, stat, and computer science, um, but I ended up really only using the computer science. Uh, I interviewed a whole bunch of different places. I did my first internship after my sophomore year at Intuit, and then my second internship at Microsoft. Then I came back full-time at Microsoft, but actually not at the team I interned on. Um, so I had kind of a little bit of a different set of things there hopping through. Um, at Microsoft, I work on the Azure team, um, or the Azure org. Um, I've worked in Azure storage, or kind of within the storage sphere of things um, for the last seven years, but on a bunch of different projects. Um, in that time, I've done a lot of interviewing for the team, um, both interns, uh, college hires, and also industry hires. Um, probably the most college and that, that kind of age range. Um, we do events, so I've probably interviewed a few hundred college and in, or college hire and internship um, offer, offers. Um, so yeah, that's my background. Um, just for context on what I do, I'm like Julia said, a, a senior software engineer. So this applies probably best for software engineers. Um, if you're going into something different, some of this advice will be applicable and some kind of won't. Um, all right, so let's get started. All right, so I think this is kind of actually the most important part. And I noticed it's something that we hadn't really gone through in the first two presentations. So this is setting up for success. Um, so when you get to the interview point, right, at that point, um, we'll go over tips on succeeding at the interview, but fundamentally, that's a very short part of your preparation. Um, the most, as this quote says here, when you're trying to exceed expectations, the most important thing you need to do is to meet expectations. And that means doing a good job in your degree program, um, taking your classes, doing well on those. I mean, studying the night before for an interview can really only go so far. And so the best thing you can do is kind of long run to learn the content. Um, I know that's kind of sounds like really obvious advice, but I think that's probably something that people tend to miss. Um, so this is, you know, take hard classes, take operating systems, take databases. This is gonna depend on the school you're at. So I don't wanna give you really specific advice because different schools kind of have different content there. Um, but what you're looking for is classes that kind of have large projects. Um, so things that you're really going to dig in and write a lot of code, um, not just, you know, answer a particular question, but oh, screen went dead there, sorry. There we go. But actually kind of dig deep and do something much broader. Um, in these projects, sometimes you'll work in groups, and I'm not saying not to divide and conquer, but make sure that you are doing the hard part of these. Um, don't kind of skimp on the work there. Um, if there's extra credit and you have time, do it. Um, just really kind of focus your time here on practicing coding day to day. School is a great resource for that. There's other ways, but that's kind of one of those first lines of defense. Um, a lot of people will tell you to do personal projects. I'm not going to tell you not to, but this is, comes back to that initial quote, when you're trying to exceed expectations, make sure you're meeting them first. So first, to make sure that you're doing kind of well at your assigned work um, through school and that sort of thing, and then get into the personal projects. Um, when it comes to personal projects, this doesn't have to be, you know, you have your own GitHub repo, though if you want it to be that, um, you, you can have it be that. Um, there's a lot of other ways to kind of be involved and to do these sort of things. Um, that can be, you know, one project you spend a lot of time on that you really kind of take end to end that's like almost like a small business sort of thing. Um, that's, I think, the most, one of the more common routes people think of. But this can also be, you know, teaching a class, being a volunteer tutor, um, that sort of thing. Teaching others is a great way to kind of make sure that you understand the content and to kind of learn it yourself. Um, you can also contribute to other people's open source projects. I don't see this a lot, but I think it's really great when I do. Um, it doesn't have to be a large contribution. It can be writing documentation. 
um, doing a single small to-do item. It really gives you experience kind of working in a larger project that's a lot more like kind of what you'll do in industry. Um, so kind of going on those repos and even just doing basic work, I mean, is something that I find really impressive. Um, but as I said, first things first, um, do kind of the basic work um, through your degree program. Um, and then beyond that, try to learn in these other ways. So that's long before you ever get to the interview. But this is focused on interviewing. So now I'll move back into kind of the interview side of things. So on a given interview, what's usually going to happen um, is you're going to start with something that's kind of a resume review or behavioral question. Um, most interviews don't just jump straight into coding, though some will. Um, so this will usually be the first part. A big point of this is actually to warm you up. To some degree, we're looking for the outcome of it, but a lot of times we're just kind of letting people get started. We know people are really nervous. Um, no one expects you to be super duper confident, and this kind of gives you a chance to get talking, get warmed up, and kind of just get ready to go. Um, so I have some examples here of the kind of things you'll see. Um, I commonly ask about if you have an internship um, on your resume, that's probably the first thing I would ask about. Um, if you haven't had an internship before, then I'll have to do something with, you know, classes you've taken or other kind of behavioral questions. Um, the big thing here, especially with internships, is don't tell me what team you were on. That's not really that important to me. It's important to me what you did on that team. Um, we realize, too, an internship is three months, so it doesn't need to be like the most impressive thing ever, but have a clear deliverable and talk about clearly what you did um, to kind of achieve that. Um, as for the more behavioral, like greatest weakness, you know, time you had a disagreement, think of a few good stories, I mean, of things that have happened to you and then tailor them to the question. Um, there's a wide array of these, but a lot of them come down to the same kind of buckets of questions. So if you just have kind of a few kind of well thought out things, you know, a group project that you did that, you know, went well or poorly, that sort of thing, just in mind, it makes it a lot easier to kind of think of something to say in the moment. Um, other things, stay on topic. Um, make sure you're answering the question I asked. <laughs> um, it's not just general story time. This isn't a super common failure, but I do occasionally people see, see people just answering the question that they wanted to hear. Um, and that's always a little funny, though not necessarily disqualifying. Um, finally, just be nice. Um, this is a point to make me want to root for you. Um, if you're nice, friendly, personable in this part, it makes me a whole lot more motivated kind of in the next part to help you succeed. Um, if you're not polite, especially, that's going to set a really bad tone for the interview. So just set the tone. Um, that doesn't mean you have to be like the most personable person ever. Not everyone is, um, but just be friendly and at the very least polite. Finally, don't complain. Um, don't tell me about how much your last boss sucked. Don't tell me that your professors are terrible, right? Maybe they are, maybe they're not, but it doesn't really kind of impress anyone um, to do that. Um, so just leave that out. All right, so I think the bulk of this and kind of what we're gonna focus on, uh, coding and problem solving. Um, I a lot of times see this presented simply as coding. Coding is kind of the first hop you have to cover. You do need to be capable of writing code, but problem solving is actually the more important part of this that I think most people are evaluating for. Um, learn your data structures, know your algorithms. I think both people that have done these presentations before said that. Um, sometimes you're gonna get more complicated things like operating systems, databases, but when I say take those classes, it's mainly so you can practice your data structures and algorithms. Most of the questions you're asked are gonna boil down to basic data structures from your intro class and building on those. So if you don't know your basic data structures, you're gonna really struggle. So data structures first, then algorithms, then all these other kind of expansion topics, but just knowing your data structures is kind of the best thing you can do to prepare yourself. Um, next thing, if you don't know the best way, say that and then solve it the way you do know. Just get code on the board. I don't wanna stall for five to 10 minutes while you're thinking, talking, doing whatever. It's okay if you don't have the total answer, but get something functional there that we can build on. Um, I, a lot of times understand that you're gonna need some help. You don't see the answer right away. Usually when I ask a question, I don't expect you to know the answer right away. Otherwise, you know, it would be kind of an easy question. So point is at least get something written down that we can build on and acknowledge that you know this is not a great solution uh, and then just move from there. Uh, communicate, like I was saying, tell me you know it's not the best solution. Tell me that you're going to write some code on the board. Make sure that's where the interviewer wants the interview to go. Make sure you understand the problem. Don't just start coding without understanding really what you're trying to do. It's okay to say, I need a minute to think. Don't sit there for five minutes saying nothing, but it's okay to take a breath, you know, just be calm, right? Listen to, listen to the question out, take a deep breath, ask a few questions, get started writing some code. 
Uh, try at that point, you're probably at the peak of your nervousness. If you're anything like me, you hear that question, you're like, oh my God, I don't know how to answer this. That's a good point to kind of take a deep breath and think about what you want to do next. When you get done with having your code on the board, check your work. Don't wait for me to check your work. It's a lot more impressive if you write bugs and you find them yourself. Uh, writing perfect code the first time is hard. But if you find the bugs you wrote, most people are not going to judge you too much for them. If you make me find them for you, you'll be more judged. You'll be judged much more harshly for that. Finally, listen closely to feedback. When I ask you questions, a lot of times I'm trying to help you. <laughs> hint that there's something wrong in this part of the code. Hint that's where I want you to go. I'm not going to say hint a lot of times. It'll be in the format of a question, but these are leading questions. So take the questions and kind of things that the interview is saying seriously. Usually they're trying to help you out. All right, design. You're not going to get many of these, but I know some people asked questions about them in the past, so I wanted to cover it. It's not common for college hires. This is something that if I went interviewed somewhere, I will get asked, um, but that's not necessarily something that you guys will. A lot of times, if we're going to ask a design question, it's going to be towards the end of the interview loop if you've done well, or actually as a personality question, because talking through a design is the kind of thing that most you know, software engineers do day to day. So when we ask this, it's a lot of times kind of just to see how you think and walk through a problem. So treat it as a conversation. Um, pretend you're designing something with a friend at school. Um, keep it fairly casual. Focus on the high level components and requirements. I hate when people bring up really spe specific technologies they don't get. Um, if you say, oh, I'd solve this with Kubernetes, I'm going to ask you about Kubernetes details. And unless you really understand that particular technology and you want to talk about it and it applies, don't bring it up. And that's rare. It does happen. Um, but as a whole, when people bring up some random thing they read about on Hacker News, um, it, it doesn't really solve the problem. And it comes off kind of as a random tangent. Uh, so these don't come up often. If they do come up, um, just treat them more as a conversation and focus on the rough block diagram sort of thing. All right, so random thoughts. Um, I know I kind of motored through this presentation. I'm trying to get um, kind of to the actual interviewing part, so forgive me if I've gone very fast. Um, the thoughts here, the, this is the best advice I ever got. It's our job to reject you, not yours. Um, we see a lot of people not apply because they think they're not qualified. They think I'm just a sophomore. I should apply, you know, just like a somewhere basic. Don't, don't I mean, not apply places, but apply to the place you want to you want to work at. If you want to work for Google, apply for Google. If you want to work for Microsoft, apply for Microsoft, right? I mean, if you get told no, don't take it personally. You can apply again next year, but give it a shot, right? I made this mistake as well earlier on, kind of after my sophomore year. I didn't really think I was qualified for things, so I didn't apply to some of the things I probably should have. Um, and this is something just to really keep in mind. Um, just apply. If you get rejected, just don't take it personally. Just move on with your life. Um, similarly, the best way to practice interviewing is to interview. So if you apply a lot of places, a lot of places will interview you and you'll get a lot of shots at doing this. Um, coding on leak code is great, right? But it's very different to have to present something to a person in the moment when you're really afraid. And most people are really afraid. And so doing this a few more times in kind of lower pressure scenarios, uh, maybe for jobs that you're not quite as interested in, right? Not your dream job, the very first time you interview um, can make things a lot easier. Um, when things don't go as planned, you're going to probably get rejected. If you apply to a lot of places, someone will reject you. Uh, I actually probably, I got rejected not too many times, but actually I got offers from Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and got rejected by some random smaller companies um, in the state I applied. So sometimes rejections are random. Um, sometimes you had a bad day. Sometimes the interviewers just asked you a question that, you know, maybe was kind of odd or hard. Um, if you're getting rejected a lot, you should think about why that is, um, just to make sure that you've kind of done that pre-prep, right? Um, whether, you know, you've actually learned the content, whether there's something else that's going wrong. But if you get a rejection here or there, don't take it as the end of the world. It happens to everybody. Um, on that note as well, when you're doing an interview, you usually have several interviewers. Um, if one doesn't go well, it's not the end of the world. Uh, just move on. Be graceful about it. Don't try to tell the interviewer their question was bad. Just say, I know this was a misfire, you know, and move, move on. Most people, when they have five interviews, one of them probably won't go perfectly. If it goes really badly, that's a problem. But if you kind of flail, flail your way through, you can make up for it later. So don't spiral if one goes bad or assume that the whole, whole day is kind of going poorly. Um, finally, um, even though it's the first bullet, nervous is normal. Um, as I've said, it's really scary to interview. It continues to be scary. Um, interviewing, I interviewed again for companies a few years ago. I decided to stay at Microsoft, but I did interview other places, and it was 
really intimidating, um, even for their level. So that never goes away. Uh, we know the people we're interviewing are nervous, and most good interviewers will try to take that into account. So don't feel like you're not qualified or that you're not kind of good because you're nervous. Take a deep breath, move on, and accept that that's normal. All right, um, Julia, I'll leave it to you. Do you want to do some questions now, or do you want to move straight to the interviews? Um, why don't we allow five minutes for questions, and then we'll go into interviews. Okay, sounds good. Anyone with a question, go ahead and either unmute yourself and ask or type it in the chat and I can read it aloud. How much time is too much to clarify the question? Uh, that depends on the question. I know that's a kind of cop-out answer. Um, probably more than a few minutes, um, unless it's like a design question where you're really gonna spend the whole interview talking. That's, you know, it really should just be a couple clarifying things. Uh, some interviewers like more questions. I usually try to set the question to be fairly clear. Um, so I don't usually expect something really drastic. It's, it's really to help you. It's however many questions you need to understand. Um, if, some, if you feel you understand the question well, tell me how you're going to approach it and move on. Um, I'm just, I really am just looking for you to understand the question. Um, do you know like a good time threshold before you decide to brute force a solution and while you're still thinking of a more optimized one? I usually prefer people to think maybe for like, you know, maybe a minute, right? And then kind of just say, I know this is brute force and get code on the board. Um, getting code on the board, it's really hard to move forward if someone doesn't have anything written down. I don't really know how to help them or guide them, right? Whereas if they write something, we can kind of talk about where to go next. If there's nothing on the board, it's really hard for me to kind of also evaluate the interview. If you don't finish, I don't know why that is. Um, so I, I really prefer people just get something down, acknowledge it's not optimal, and then half the time while they're writing it, they'll realize the next thing to do even without my prompting. Sounds good, thank you. Yep. We got another question. Um, are there any cases where you accepted the candidate even though they did not get the right answer? Are you looking for them to get the right oh. answer? <laughs> yeah, that happens all the time. So usually we'll have a couple, at least on the loops I am, where we kind of have a good pre-planned loop. Um, we'll ask kind of maybe some easier questions up front, and then we'll get into questions we a lot of times don't expect people to fully answer. Um, a lot of times I expect an answer, but there's better answers I don't expect people to get to. It's really common in interviews to not, to have, expect someone to get the first part of it, right? To get code on the board, to get kind of a basic answer, but the very optimal is sometimes very challenging. So this depends on the inter the kind of the interviewer, but it's really normal not to finish the entire question. Um, that's, that's very, very normal. So don't worry about that too much. Always make sure you have something on the board though. <laughs> Interesting question. If there's more than one coding round, is it okay to switch languages if we think we can write a better solution in another language? Sure. Some interviewers will specify the language to do it in. I always just ask people to do it whatever language they're comfortable in. I probably didn't even ask what language you did it in the last interview, so I may not even know because um, I really don't care. So unless you're working at a company that maybe is really invested in a particular language, I don't think we usually even talk about that that much between the interviewers. Um, cool. Sanjeev, your question uh, is literally the point of today we will be doing a full run through of a poor response and a good response um and krishma what are some mistakes you see students making when communicating their thought process for a solution i think that will also be answered when we run through the bad version um i can give a brief answer yeah. to that though nonetheless the biggest mistake is not communicating to me at all what you're doing and just writing a bunch of stuff <laughs> without really any context at all um, and then there's some more nuanced mistakes, but the first one is just saying absolutely nothing. So that, that's probably number one. Okay, and um, we'll do one last question from Ben. What do you do when you realize you've understood the problem wrong a few minutes into explaining your thought process or God forbid your interviewer tells you that you misunderstood? Say, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Let's pivot and get the right question. Just acknowledge it went wrong and then immediately try to go back to the right thing. Um, it's always, that's always the best thing to do. Just admit the mistake, move on with your life. It's, it happens. And I just got one more question that actually I think would be great to answer. Does syntax matter when implementing the data structures or is pseudocode okay? 
I do prefer correct code. It doesn't need to have every semicolon in the right place, but it needs to look like code. If you tell me you're writing Python, it should look like Python. Um, a couple little mistakes, like I don't know this particular like name of the structure in Java or something. I mean, then you can make it up and say, I don't remember whether this class is named, you know, linked list or hash map or hash site. As long as you explain kind of like what it is there, but I do expect kind of the basic code, like the for loops, the arrays, that sort of thing, the basics of the language to be consistent with that language. Cool. All right, with that, let's move forward into our bad interview. So um, I'm gonna introduce Eddie here, and I just want everyone to know that Eddie is actually a fantastic interviewer um, or interviewee, but we have intentionally uh, crafted a bad interview setup. So he is doing this on purpose, and this is meant to be educational. This is not his action. This is not what he would actually do in a real interview. Um, so <laughs> just want to uh, start with that. And Eddie, uh, take it away. Want to introduce yourself? Sounds now? good. Hey everyone, my name is Eddie. Um, I'm a rising junior at Case Western Reserve University, studying computer science and statistics. And yeah, I'm looking forward to you know bombing this interview. So. <laughs> I'll share my screen. Um, okay, cool. Uh, can you guys see that? Yep, we can see it, Eddie. Perfect. So I'll get started. Eddie, um, let's assume at this point we've done kind of the intros, we've gone over his resume or done a behavioral question, we're going to get started with the coding now. Um, so Eddie, can you implement a hash map for me in the language of your choice? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, the language that I'm going to be using is Java, and uh, I'm not too familiar with a hash map. I th so hash maps, if I recall, have a key and a value. Um, I guess I'll kind of go over this question real quickly. Uh, okay, so I need to design a hash map that includes three functions. Uh, put, um, which inserts a key value pair into the hash map. And if the value already exists in the hash map, then I should update the value. Okay, and then get, um, which just gets the specific key, and remove, which removes the value. Okay. Um, okay. Let's think. Um, I guess, I mean, can I use like different data structures, like, like a hash map to implement this? I don't function? think you probably want to use a hash map to implement a hash map. No, okay, figured. Um, gotcha. Um, okay, well, I know I want to use some sort of data structure to, I guess, hold on to the, like, the key and values, right? Um, so maybe if, uh, maybe, like, using a stack to, like, a, like a stack that has two ends, basically. How would that um, work? Yeah, so, so first I'll need to initialize my stack. Um, should I start coding right now or should I explain the algorithm, I guess? Let, let's get a little more explanation before. Okay, sure. Make sure I understand where we're going. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think if we use a stack, uh, we can, like if we have a put, we can just put the key and value like into our stack. Um, and like record, so like have another maybe data structure like an array to record the order of like the key value pairs in my stack. Um, just, just to re rewind for a minute, what's yeah, the sure. time complexity for a get and a put in a hash map? Uh, so if I remember correctly, get and put are both uh, O of uh, one, so constant. Um, they have O of one time complexities. Okay, so does your solution meet those, meet those goals? Um, I guess not because, well, maybe it does. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure how to do this one, I guess. Uh, do you have any like advice, I guess? Or? Um, I think the, the big thing to keep in mind is what the goal of a hash map is. Um, so yeah. let's make sure the solution we come up with meets that time complexity, because with a hash map, that's kind of the point of it, right? In general, we do hash maps when we want look up to be fast. So let, let's maybe maybe start with start more with the basics and, and go from there. Okay, sure. Um, so I guess you, yes, I think you can do it with the solution you gave. I'm totally open to seeing that as well. If that's okay. Right. Um, actually, 
I'll, I guess I'll try something else then. Um, so maybe if I have like two lists, uh, one to like hold on to the key uh, and one to hold on to the values and I, um, whenever I have to put, whenever I have to use my put function, I just put both the key and the keys, like let's say we're using like a link list or something and then I'll put my value in the values link list um, just so they're like in the same like order, I guess. Um, whenever I'm retrieving them here. Okay, let's let's get some code on the board and just kind of see what we end up with. Yeah, let's sure. Um, so I know I have to use some sort of list. I'm going to use an array list actually. Um, and oh, I, I forgot to ask, but are these num integers or can they be like strings? And this is what we can do is with with particular. I think here we have int key and int value for put. So let's go with that. We don't need to make it change. Okay. Let's not overcomplicate our lives. Okay, so just this. Um, so I'm going to call my, uh, sorry, I'm going to call my, the list that holds onto the keys, uh, keys. Um, and I'm going to make another array list to hold onto the, to the values and call that values. Um, okay, so now I have to initialize my data structures. Um, I'm not too familiar with how to initialize these. Um, let's think. Okay, well, I know that when I'm initializing a normal thing, I do like keys equals new array list, right? Um, so I think I can use this constructor to initialize in, initialize these objects, um, and then I'll be able to like just append uh, values to like both of these lists. Okay. Uh, so keys equals new array list, and then values also equals new array list. Okay, that's pretty simple. Um, and now I guess for my put function, I need to first test if the key is already in the list, correct? Um, so how do we check if the key is already in my array list? Uh, I guess I could iterate through the, through the keys array list. Um, so I do a simple for loop. Um, through the keys array list. And then if the, element I'm on is included in my keys list, then I need to update the value, right? Um, let's see. So if keys dot get i, if the i element of my keys list is equal to the key that I'm looking for, okay, so if that equals key, then I'll need to update the value, right? So I'll need to just add it into my list. Um, so I guess values that add value, right? Um, okay, and then otherwise the key is not in the keys list, which means that the value is not in the values list. So I just need to add that to the beginning, I think of the list or maybe the middle, I'm not sure. Um, let's just add it to the beginning for now, I guess. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's right, actually. Yeah, that, that looks right to me. Um, okay, so now my get. Okay, so get returns the value to which the specific key, key is mapped for negative one if this map contains no mapping, okay. Does that make sense? I guess this question, like, should it be negative one if? What else would it be? Uh, yeah, I guess I'm not sure. Okay, so negative one sounds good. Um, um, so I need to iterate through my keys again because that like stores the keys right to my map. Um, so I'll do another for loop, um, whoops just to iterate through the keys array list. And then if 
my if my key at the or sorry if the element at the ith index is equal to key then i can just return the value right so since my values is already like ordered um like it, it, it has the same like pair um, with the key. Uh, I'll do if keys that get i equals key like I did above there. And then just, what do I do? Like print out the value, right? So I just print out the value. Um, okay, that looks good to me. Um, remove, let's kind of, Maybe go through what you already have here. Okay, sure. Uh, with, are you sure? You, are, sh do you want me to finish remove first, or are you sure you want to? Let's go back for a little bit. Okay, sure. Before we do remove, let's make sure we have put and get right. Okay, sure. Yeah. So I mean, these look good to me. Um, if keys dot get i equals key, this looks good. And I mean, I don't know what should I. Let's maybe let's maybe think through some test cases. Sure. We have some great test cases actually right on the left here. So that's even a little bit done for you here. So let's maybe walk through one of those. Okay, sure. Put one one. Let's try that. Sure. So one one. I'm putting one in. Um, right now, my both my keys array and my uh, values array list are both size zero. Um, so I'm starting out. So this uh, iterates once. Um, if keys dot get i equals key. Well, I know that keys doesn't have anything yet, so this isn't true. So I just go to the beginning. Um, and yeah, so then I add to the beginning, right, my key, and then I add in my values array list, add to the beginning my value. So then this would be, I mean, this would just be key, or sorry, this would be one, and then one, right? And I think that's correct, right? Like in a okay. hash map? Let's, let's try the next one. Let's try the two, two. Okay, two, two. Um, so now my both uh, array lists are size two, or sorry, size one. Um, and then again, the key does not appear in my uh, keys list. So then I add it. Oh, I see. I add it to the beginning here. Hmm. I think, is that what we want? I'm not too familiar with hash maps. Well, well, we'll do a get and then we can see if it's what we want. Okay, so let's, let's cool. Let's go do yeah. the get now. And we can see if that's doing what we want it to. Sure, I think, okay, I think my get works. Um, so I go through the uh, keys array list of size two. If the element is equal to the key, then I just return uh, the element. Are you returning uh, or are you printing it? Oh, yeah, I'm printing it by accident. Okay, so I'll return it here. Oh yeah, and then you told me to return negative one if it's not in the in the array list. Okay, so okay. keys that get i equals key. So I mean, right now we want keys hash map that get one. So um, my size is two, so it's going to iterate through the entire. Sorry, it's going to inter iterate through the entire keys array list. Um, so yeah, so this is true um, when we get to this position. So then I return one, and that looks good to me. Okay, does that meet the runtime complexity we talked about at the beginning? Uh, I think so, right? So a hash map has constant, uh, constant uh, time complexity for put and get, and I think this is constant, right? Because at least for put, I'm putting it in the beginning um, right here, right? Because I know that add has a, and how about for get? Does get meet those runtime complexities? Uh, I think so because I mean I'm returning negative one, right? So like if it's not in the if it's not in the map, then I don't do any of this. And then I just return negative one. So I think that's constant, right? How about if it is in the map? If it is in the map, um, Honestly, I'm not too sure like what the different time, comp I mean, okay, so this is a for loop, right? So that's O of N. Okay, so I guess this is O of N. Um, yeah, so I guess it wouldn't work. Okay, how about you take a minute, think for a minute, and then maybe we'll, we'll think about what we need to change here, but think for a minute, and then we'll, we'll circle back. Okay, actually, I think I can go straight into, 
I think I know what to, how to fix this actually. So, okay. what do you want to do? We were, if we were to add like a, sorry, let me keep this here. If we were to add like a, maybe like this is a dynamic programming question. So, if I add like another array to like, hold that seems on. a little complicated. Let's yeah. let's. Yeah, dynamic okay. programming is a whole other can of worms. I don't think we need to get quite that far into things. Mm, okay. I promise this is easier than that. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm not too Take sure then. To think. Take a minute to think. I think you can. Okay. Um, What's another data structure you could use besides a linked list? Um, so, I mean, the only data structures I know are hash maps, linked lists, stacks. Um, oh, I guess instead of using a list, can we use like an array maybe? That sounds like a great place to go next. Okay. Um, gosh, I'm not sure. Because, um, oh, wait, but in, I think in Java, you can append to arrays, right? So I can just declare an array up here. Like that, maybe. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure, honestly. How do I do this? Um, Julia, is it time to put him out of his misery yet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, why don't we put him out of his misery? You point out a few things that, um, aside from like, like we can talk about the conceptual stuff, but anything else that, you know, we're just, clearly red flags that you would uh over the goods and the bads so one good thing eddie didn't just sit there in silence and write this all wrong in silence um that would have been worse at least i knew what he was thinking um even if it was completely wrong um and that made it a little easier for me to try to ask some prompting questions um so that i will say is the one decent part of this interview um we didn't think eddie writing in silence would probably do a lot of value for you guys but that is something that happens so there's at least one thing that went okay um, if you noticed, uh, when I asked him questions, he just kind of motored right by, didn't really think about what I was prompting him to think about, uh, spat out something random, and then just did the next thing he wanted to do. Um, that is a common failure point. Usually when someone asks you a question in an interview, they're trying to help you, like I was here. So take, take a deep breath, take your time. Um, another thing up front, uh, maybe thinking a little bit more about the data structures he was going to use. That's the most important part of the question is before you ever start coding. Uh, that's, that's a big one. Um, I even tried to prompt him to have a minute to think and he chose not to take the minute I prompted him to take. Uh, so that probably would have been a good thing on his part. Uh, kind of no questions of value. One of the questions I kind of assume on this is it's the hash map. What goes into a hash? There's your big hint. Um, you kind of need to think about whether you have a hash function or not. Um, in this interview, I didn't do that, but a lot of times I would actually prompt people to think about that. That's something I maybe should have done to help Eddie a little more and say, if it's called a hash map, what does hash mean? Uh, Eddie did at least know the runtime complexity. That's one good thing um, that came out of this as well. He did give O of 1, at least for some of that. Uh, that I guess that's, that's some of the pros, cons. Other questions from the group on goods and bads here? Things you saw Eddie do? Seems like he was respectful, at least. He was. He was yeah. very, very pleasant, and that is always good. <laughs> I should have been more uh, rude, I guess. Yeah, you could have been more Out of rude. My nature. Yeah. <laughs> quiet, quiet and rude. <laughs> We got someone in the chat that says he brought up data structures slash solutions first before understanding the question fully. He was really vocal with the interviewer, but also stated he doesn't know how to do it multiple times. Um, he let the interviewer give him a lot of hints and help before coding. He asked direct questions about what data structures he should implement. He been coding a solution in a pretty straightforward way, which I think is good, but that maybe wasn't completely determined first. He was definitely unfamiliar with what a hash map is. Um, and to be clear, if Eddie had said at the beginning, I haven't done hash maps in a while, let me take a minute to think about that, I might have been more likely to help him along. So if he, it's okay to state that you don't remember the details of this at the beginning, um, but then say you're going to think about it or ask a specific question. 
uh, rather than kind of just moving on. I would kind of expect you to know what a hash map is, but if for some reason you didn't know it, kind of being a little bit more, you know, upfront about that at the beginning and prompting me to help you would have been helpful, not halfway through. What should you do in an example where, like, let's say you get this question in an interview and you have legitimately never worked with hash maps before? What do you say? Um, so first of all, say as an interviewer, that's weird. Um, I would <laughs> I will say that it's uncommon. It does happen. If you, if you say, I just didn't study those, I covered them two years ago, but I kind of forgot what they are. Um, can we do a little review? Might have been a way to approach that. It would be a little bit of a red flag, but if after that you did a great job, it's something I could maybe overlook, um, especially for a college hire, as long as you kind of did well after that. So it's still better upfront to let me help you and maybe take some hints I wish I didn't have to give than to completely flood the question all the way through. So. One person asks, have you ever canceled an interview because the applicant was so bad slash didn't know anything mid-interview? Nope, we'll be nice all the way through. And in fact, usually if someone's doing poorly, I'll still try to be positive because sometimes people have a bad interview and they'll do great in the next two. That's rare, but we have had it happen that someone was really flustered or something in the first one and actually did recover. So most interviewers that are a little more experienced will even try to make it a positive experience. And this one, I might've even swapped the question halfway through and tried to roll it back to something easier just to make sure that Eddie didn't get off his roll for the whole day. Um, watching him fluster his way through this question for an hour doesn't give me any information um, that I don't already have at this point in the interview. Um, so that's probably something I even would have pivoted to is just to knock it back a level and kind of get an idea of whether he could do a simpler question. One last question before we launch into the good interview. Um, at what point did you realize that you're not gonna move forward with this candidate? Um, like I said, I, I would have said no at this point, right? But I don't decide for the whole loop. If he did great in the next two or three interviewers, I probably wouldn't block this hire. So I will be blunt about that. That's very rare, but it does happen. Um, as for when I decided I was going to say no, um, Probably somewhere that not even at the point where he had a key array of keys and an array of values, people actually make that mistake a lot. But at the point where I kind of started to prompt him that that wasn't correct and he didn't pivot to go back and look at a different solution. Um, there's a lot of people that misfire this question on the first round. If 10 minutes in, they pivot to the correct solution, usually we can overlook that. Um, so it's the point where I prompted him and he just kind of didn't fail to actually reverse course. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Eddie, for that wonderful Yay. example of how no not problem. to That was very painful. So thank you. That was very <laughs> painful for everybody. No worries. Glad I could help. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Um, <laughs> and let's move on to actually solving this um, in a good way that would hopefully result in a recommendation for hire. So um, with that, Fouad, take it away. Yeah, for sure. Hey, everyone. My name's Fouad. Uh, I'm going to my senior year at McMaster University in Canada. I'm studying biomedical engineering. Uh, I've done like a ton of different internships, um, worked at Tesla, the CIA. I'm currently at Twitter, finishing up uh, an internship there and then graduating next year, hopefully, fingers crossed, but we'll see. Uh, excited for this interview. Great. Let me share well, my screen real quick. To get started. All right, so let's share your screen and we'll get started. Let's assume at this point for everybody in the group that we've done the behavioral and also that was a great inter, in, you know, Oh, great intro from, from him that was very friendly. So I'll already say that's a, that's a great start. <laughs> let's get going. So um, let's, let's today we're going to sit down and implement a hash map. What language would you like to uh, do? It's okay. I'm going like to be using Python. Python. Okay, that would be great. Awesome. Cool. So um, I'm just going to something up in our, in our table by going through it linearly. But we actually want to have a hash function that can um, you know, translate to a specific bucket that we want to look in. Um, so for the purpose of this question, uh, are we going to have to write our own hash function or can we use an inbuilt one in Python or are you going to provide new one? Well, let's talk first for hash function. What, what makes a good hash function? Yeah. Um, so with a good hash function, what we want to do is we want to use all the input data that we're given. So we want the function to operate on the entire input. Um, so the, the examples look like our inputs are integers. I don't know if that's an accurate assumption to make. Like, are we also going to be handling strings as well? Or will they just be integers like in the case of the example? That's a great question. We can just assume integers. OK. Um, so assuming integers, all we have to do is really use that one integer. Um, so with the hash function, what we want to do is we want to make sure that um, whatever hash function we use maps um, evenly across the distribution of the table. So what that means is like, Let's say we have uh, an, an array to represent the, the, the buckets in the table. 
um, and there are like you know a thousand elements in that array. Uh, we don't want function the function to map only to zero to five hundred. We want the function to map across the entire thing to make sure that we're actually using the entire space we're given. Um, another thing is we want it to be yeah we don't want it to clump either. So um, you know an example of that is like if we're always dividing by two or something like that, then they would all, all clump to like factors of two. Uh, but we want our hash function to be like robust and and match like every element. Um, another another thing about um, yeah, sort of <laughs> you got sorry, yeah. sorry, go ahead. No. Sorry, I think this was yeah. a function of being a call. Go on to the last thing you were saying. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, another thing that we want our hash function to do is uh, we want to like generate very different hashes. We don't want to gener generate similar similar values. Um, so. Um, an example could be for a string if one character is missing, we don't want the hash function to have, like be similar for those two strings. Uh, but in the case of the integer, uh, obviously the consideration is a little bit different. Um, so given those, um, I could design a hash function for an integer, uh, but would you prefer that, um, that I- You can assume the built-in one has the characteristics you described. Okay, cool. So I'm just gonna call it like this if that's okay. Sounds good. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so let's, let's talk about our options with building a hash map. Um, I think there's probably two main routes that we can go down. Um, we can either go for open hashing or closed hashing. Um, and so I'll kind of explain the difference between those two. Um, so in the open hashing scenario, um, what I envision with the solution and, um, correct me if I'm wrong is, uh, we're going to have like different buckets and what's going to happen is we're going to use our hash function to determine where to put. Uh, so in the put case, for example, we're going to use our hash function on the key to determine which bucket to put it in. Once our hash function gives us a value um, through that sort of like operation with the key, um, what we want to do is uh, at that bucket, if there's nothing currently in that bucket, we'll put it in there. Um, and uh, that, that'll be the put operation. And then the get will be just the exact reverse where uh, we use the hash function to figure out which bucket it's in. And we check to see if that's the, the, the key that we have. And if it is, we return it. Um, so as you can kind of see, there's like one really big issue here, um, which is the case of a collision. Um, so, you know, in the case of a collision, um, we use our hash function and then we, we realize that there's already something in that bucket. So let me just think really quickly about how we want to maybe deal with that scenario. So when we use the hash function and we realize that there's already something in that bucket, um, I think with the open hashing scenario, what we want to do is uh, we want to actually like maybe create a linked list from that bucket. And um, that linked list will contain all the previous elements that have been hashed to the same value. Hopefully if we have a good hash function that won't happen too often, uh, but you know, uh, it's still something we should account for in our solution, I think. So um, yeah, so, uh, I think how that would work is, yeah, with a linked list, what would happen is that if you if you hash to a bucket that already has something in it, you check the first element of that linked list to see if it's the same element. If it is, then you know you've already like you already have um, something in that uh, bucket that corresponds to that key. Um, so um, in that case, do you think we'd want to update the value or would we want to just keep the current value that's there? You know what Python normally does in the built-in solution. Um, I think Python would probably just return the value that's that's there currently, right? Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So maybe that's a good solution for the for the put. Um, and um, the and so if there isn't um, that key currently in that position, then what we want to do is we want to traverse that link list going forwards um, and see if the key is there. If the key isn't there, we just add it on to the end of the link list. Okay. Um, and so I think um, you know going off this kind of like solution of using a linked list, there's kind of a clear um, worst case scenario where if the hash function is really, really badly designed and everything goes to the same bucket, we'd actually end up having O of N lookup time because we'd have to traverse through the entire linked list. Um, so yeah, design a hash function will definitely be key. So I'm just gonna be using the Python inbuilt one and hopefully hopefully that does a good job. Um, Sounds good. Let's get some code on the board and we can circle yeah. around to alternative solutions at the end. Yeah, for sure. So the first thing um, we have to kind of realize is uh, if we're using a linked list, we'd have to make um, a separate linked list node class. Um, so I'm just going to do that really quick. Um, so I'm just going to call it list node and we probably want to have uh, some kind of initializer um, and it wants to take in a key and a value. Um, and so what we want to do is we want to set the key to the key provided 
Uh, we'd want to set the value to the value provided. And uh, it also needs to have um, like a next value because we need some way of traversing it. So we'll, we'll just set that to none for now because uh, when you first initialize a node, it doesn't have a next. Um, cool, so this is the node class that I'm gonna be using in my function. Um, and like I mentioned, we want an array to have like sort of um, like a, a bucket of items. Um, so why don't we initialize that array um, as our table um, in the initializer as well. So we'd want self.table equals, um, you know, um, they're just buckets for now and they don't have anything inside them. They'll have objects of list node in them later. Um, so why don't we just initialize that to be, hmm, what, let's think about size here. Um, how large do you think our hash table should be? Like how much data do you think we'll be processing? What do you think? Um, hmm. What are some choices? What are some different, different ways we could approach this? Yeah, so um, like one of the good, one of the principles of having a good um, hash table is that we don't want it to be too full. So depending on how much data we have, we'd probably want to multiply by like two or three times to make sure that you know we're not re really ever reaching the upper bounds of it. Because as you get closer to the upper bounds, the the chance for collisions is higher. Um, so I think you know, kind of given given like what we've we've done here with um, you know the examples, um, I'm going to assume that maybe we're processing um, you know 200 to 300 different items. We can start there and we can also yeah. expand later. That's exactly, good. yeah. Cool. Um, and then uh, one thing that I do know is that um, with a hash function, because they're mathematically related and uh, because like a math function usually performs a series of math operations on you know your key that you're putting in into the hash function, um, I know that it's better to use a prime number for your hash table size. Uh, because what happens with a prime number is that um, there are less divisors of a prime number. So um, if you're dividing and moduloing uh, repeatedly in your hash function, um, then what will end up happening is if there's less divisors, it'll clump less along those divisors. So I'm going to use a, a prime number for the hash table size, and I think that'll probably help with collisions as well. Um, so uh, in our initializer, we also want something called size to make sure that we, you know, we, we can change this as we go, but for now, let's just make it, um, I said, you know, maybe three times the size of our input, and our input was 200, 300. So why don't we use like a thousand and thousand is obviously not a prime number. So I think the closest one is 997. Um, we, can, we can verify that. Not at us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, cool. And then we want to initialize our table to be, um, you know, whatever size we determined before. Um, so we can just use the size we determined above there. Cool. Um, so now let's get into the actual implementation of our puts and things like that. Um, so when we put something into our hash table, what we want to do is we want to use the hash function that we're given um, and figure out which bucket within the 997 to do. Um, and because you know we can't really guarantee like what number is going to come out of the hash function, we we should make sure that it falls be somewhere between that 997. So we're going to be using like a modulo. Um, so the first thing that we want to do is, um, like I mentioned before, it's 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 an array of buckets. So um, like we'll want to be traversing that array using indexes. So why don't we call our index to be, you know, whatever is returned by the hash function um, of the key. So we're hashing the key and then uh, we're moduloing by self.size so that it falls somewhere within that 997 buckets. And this is the bucket that we want to put it in. Um, so once we know what bucket we want to put it in, um, we need to go check that bucket to make sure that it doesn't already currently have the key that's there. Um, if it does, um, we discussed this before, but we'll just return the key, I guess. Um, and if it, uh, if it doesn't exist there, like if there's nothing in that bucket, we want to put that uh, key value pair in that bucket. And then continuing on, if there um, is another item there, we just want to traverse down the link list and put it at the end. Um, so why don't we consider those three kind of like scenarios separately? Um, so if, um, self.table at um, index um, is equal to none, which it will be if it's empty, um, then what we want to do is we want to put something at that bucket and we want that to be a list node. So uh, we can create um, sort of our own list node. So let's, let's put self.table at that index will now be assigned a list node at, uh, and the list node has two elements. It has a key and a value and it also has a next. Um, if we just create it using the initializer, the next will be none for now. And I think that's okay because we only have the one item. Um, so 
yeah, why don't we do that? So key value. And so in the case that there's nothing in that bucket, we've just added a new list node to that bucket with the key value pair. Um, cool. The other case is that there is something at that bucket. And then there are two cases from there. One is that, you know, that there's already something in that bucket with that key value in which we want to return it. Um, the other case is um, there's not something in that bucket that we want to return. Um, and so we have to add it to the end of that list. So why don't we, um, you know, just keep track of what uh, key we're looking at. So current key, we'll just call that the current key of the list node object that we're at. So self.table and um, this self.table at index is a list node object. Um, so we will take the object and we'll get the key from it. So if current key um, underscore key is equal to um, the key that we're looking for, then we want to return that key value pair. Um, if it's not, um, then we want to continue on and traverse. So what I'm seeing here is that we're going to have to actually make this check for every um, list node item. So instead of including it here, why don't we maybe include it in a loop? So we want to loop through, and let's think about the conditions of our loop as well. How long do we want to loop through this list node for? Um, so we're going from one element to the next in our linked list, and we want to loop until uh, we reach the end element. And the end element will be the case where the next element in, of that list node is a none. So why don't we loop while um, we also want to keep track of, of I guess, the, um, the list node that we're at. So current node is equal to self.table at index. And so while um, current node is not equal to none, then we want to keep looping. Because if the current node is none, then we can't do any operations on it. Um, cool. So um, what we want to do is here, we want to actually perform that check to see if the key um, is, is the key that we're looking for. Um, so let's let's actually perform that check. So if current key is equal to uh, the key that we're looking for, uh, we said that we want to just return the key. Um, and if it's not the current key that we're looking for, um, we want to current node is equal to current node dot next, and the value the value of dot next will be the next list node that exists there. And so we keep looping until we either find um, that that key already exists in that link list. And if it doesn't exist, uh, we, we just keep looping. And then by the end of this loop, you know, eventually we'll reach a none, which means the end of it. Um, and hmm, maybe we don't want to loop until current node is equal to none, because then we don't have a reference from the previous node to update it. So instead, um, why don't we do current node dot next is unequal to none. Um, and that'll still that'll still allow us to kind of get um, get to um, get to the same point uh, in terms of breaking the loop, but then we'll have a reference to create the next list node. And so what happens is at the end of this loop, if we haven't reached this return scenario, um, then what we want to do is we want to create a new list node and put it at the end. Um, so current node dot next is equal to list node with the new key and value pair. Does that make sense to you? That looks good so far. Awesome. OK. Um, so um, I think um, that solves the, the second scenario case. Um, but we need to make sure we're returning something. And so um, I think uh, as the question was kind of put up, the return type is a none. So um, if the return type is a none, uh, does it make more sense to maybe return none here um, instead of the key? Yeah, that would be fine, too. Cool. And then at the end of this, sorry, <laughs> just one of them, and that's fine. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Um, and then at the end of this, we'd we'd want to return uh, none as well. And um, here, if you know, if we have already created the index, we want to we we don't want to have to consider any of these other scenarios as well. Um, so it'll go from the if uh, it won't catch this else, and then it'll just return none as well. So I don't think we need to update anything there. Okay. Cool. So I think. Um, like judging, judging from our um, code so far, uh, we're, we're good with the put and, and we'll go through this with an example as well, for sure. Uh, but why don't we move on to the get? Um, so with the get scenario, what we want to do is we want to um, look at that 
bucket that the hash function tells us to look at given the key value. And we want to see if we can get the value from there. Um, and so we know that's the, the item that's in the bucket will be a list node. Um, and so it's as simple as like calling node dot key. Um, so we want to first do is we want to find the index that we're at. So let's call that ha hash function again using the key and modulo it by um, whatever our table size is. And that's the index that we want to look at, the bucket that we want to look at. And then let's see the fourth wall here for a second. I'm keeping yeah. an eye on time and I want to make sure we get time at the end to kind of talk through the two solutions. So if you want to just whip this out real quick. Um, yeah, just yeah, yeah. See it. Cool. Normal yeah, no worries. This is where I'm saying break the fourth wall, but normally we have an hour. So <laughs> yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. I'll just have um, you right now so we can move, move forward. Yeah. So let's do current node. Let's figure out what our current node is. Our current node will be our table at, um, index and we want to check if no dot key is equal to uh wait um yeah let's loop through this because we're gonna have to make this check multiple times uh what we want to do is is equal to the key that we're looking for um we can return the value of the current node. And if it else, we want to keep looping through um, and go to our next node. And so what will happen is we're checking on each step to see if, if we have the key. Um, if we do return the value that we're looking for, else keep going and traversing down. Um, at the end of this, we'll get to a point where um, the current node uh, value is next. Um, and so we want to return an int. So um, if the current node dot value is unequal to, uh, sorry, current node dot key is unequal to key return negative one, else return uh, current node dot value. So that'll do the final check for the last node that we're at. Um, cool, and now we need to do a remove. So for the remove case, it's the same thing. We basically want to find um, the index that we want to remove from, given the hash and the key, uh, we want to modulate it by the size, and we want to get that current node. Um, if that node doesn't exist, um, um, then what we want to do is return none because we can't remove something that doesn't exist. Else, we can remove whatever code. So normally you'd have to finish this. Normally in an interview, I actually wouldn't necessarily ask remove unless there was an issue with the first two. Normally, I just ask put and get. So I think okay. we can actually pause here. And I saw a few questions flying by that I wanted to answer on the technical part of this. So we'll just take yeah, a for sure. pause so that I can go through those. Um, yeah. So one of the things that came up was around time complexity. Um, with time complexity, there's a couple different ones, right? There's best case, there's worst case, there's average case. Um, with these, what we're looking for is an O of one average case. People are right that worst case, if you're iterating through a linked list, you know, you are going to be O of, o of one. Um, that's where it's really important to pick a good size um, when you're doing, you know, hash maps. If you think you're going to hash a thousand items, you need to have something that's significantly bigger or somewhat bigger than that, at least, to make sure that you don't have a bunch of these collisions. Um, here and there, having a collision, right, no big deal in terms of complexity. But if you have, you know, an array that's maybe five indexes long and then you put a thousand items into it, you're right, it's going to be largely kind of closer to O of N. Uh, so that, that's something where hash maps are really, really useful in practice when you set them up right. Part of the reason I like people to be, answer, be able to answer this question is it makes sure that people won't make that mistake. Because if you understand how these are implemented, it's much clearer um, when you're creating one how you need to set it up. Cool. All right, was there any, were there other code questions we wanted to do at this point, Julia? I don't know if you've been monitoring. That was kind of the one I saw. I was kind of watching things fly by and I saw quite a bit of questions around that. Was there other yeah, no, there have been a lot of questions. I think stepping through an example might be really helpful so that we can um, see how this code actually functions. 
And that is yeah, do we want to walk through next at this point. So let's step through an example. Yeah, for sure. So why don't we, why don't we do an example to make sure that our implementation is correct? Um, so we can use the examples that we currently have kind of in, in, the, um, in the problem itself. Uh, so the first example is like putting with a key of one and a value of one. Um, so let's walk through our put function and see what happens when we do that. I'll use the comms to kind of track um, as we go along. So first things first, we uh, find an index or like a bucket for our, our, our function. Um, we'll also like initialize, you know, a, a new hash map with a size of 997 and 997 buckets. Um, so, you know, imagine there are 997 spots here, but they're all empty for now. They all have a none. So um, we create uh, an index or figure out which index we want to put that um, first item in, which has a, a, a key of one and a value of one. Um, and so let's say that spits out a number from a hash function that's like 225. Um, then we want to put that in bucket 225 of our, of our items. Um, so first we check to see um, our table. Is there anything at that index? Um, right now there isn't because we just initialized it and we initialized them with nuns. Um, and so what we do is we go to our table, we create a new list node, we'll create it with a key of one and a value of one. And, um, you know, we won't go through this else statement because uh, we satisfied this condition. So we'll go straight here and return none. And so that now at 225, there will be a new list node object. And that list node object will have a key of one and a value of one as well. Um, and so, um, you know, I think that um, we actually accomplished this in, in our stated time. We did this in O of one time because, um, you know, the hash function is just like the one operation and then we return none. Um, and so I, similarly with the two, um, you know, depending on if our- Two is a collision, just for, just for demonstration. Yeah. Okay, cool, let's walk through a collision. So um, let's assume two is a collision then. And so it also hashes to 225. Um, so what will happen then is there is an element other than none at that table element. So what we want to do is we want to make, uh, let's record the current key in the current node. And um, while the current node dot next is unequal to none, um, we want to perform this operation. We want to keep checking the key and, and making sure that um, it's not the current key that we're at. If it is, then we return none. Um, otherwise, we, we continue to the next key. So obviously in, in this scenario, um, the one is not the key that we're looking for, so we don't have that scenario. So what we'll do is we'll actually um, check, um, or we'll actually add on to the end of that linked list. So current node.next will be a new list node with the key and the value given. And the key and the value given are two and two. So um, chaining off from this node, the next item next would be um, a new list node object. Um, and that would have a key of two and a value of two. Um, I did realize that there's one issue that we're not accounting for here. Um, and I think the issue is we're checking to see if current node dot next is not equal to none. Uh, but we're not actually checking the current node key value because there could be the scenario where um, there is only one list node there and its value was two and two, or sorry, its key was two and its value was two. So we actually need to check that here as well and then make sure to return none if that's happening. So um, we can accomplish that with an if statement here. It's a little inelegant. Maybe we can clean this up later if we have time. Um, but um, if um, current key is equal to um, the key that we're looking for, return none as well. Because that'll, hap that'll happen in, in the scenario I just mentioned. Cool. Um, so yeah, so in that, in that scenario, we had a collision. There were two items at bucket 225. Uh, we made, uh, we already had a list node item there. So we just updated uh, the list node item to have another list node item coming after it with an, a key of two and a value of two. Okay, so Julia, at this point, do you want to go through an example and get, or do you want to move on to comparing some open closed hashing or do you want to move on to questions? Your call. Um, I think one other thing that would be good to uh, look at here is, um, yeah, let's look at, let's look at get and, um, then move on to people's questions and just understanding other concepts that are used here. Sounds good. Cool. So let's go through the, uh, get three example and let's assume that our current implementation has the, um, the chained collision that we had, um, previously. So we want to get uh three and it's supposed to return negative one, not found. Um, so, um, let, let's see what happens. So we, we figure out which bucket um, uh, three is supposed to be in. 
um, let's assume uh, for this sake or for this problem's sake that it's like 350. Um, so uh, we chat we set the current node to be self dot table um, at the current index, um, and that would be a none. Um, and so none of these operations would kind of pass. Oh, so we need to include a check for a none here uh, because we won't be able to call uh, none dot key. That'll throw an error in Python for sure if it's a none. So um, let's let's include a check right off the bat where if the current node is equal to none, then we return negative one because it doesn't exist. Um, and so um, let's assume that actually there was something at 350, but it wasn't um, it wasn't something with the key three. Um, so let's walk through that scenario and see what happens. So let's say at 350 there was you know an item with a key of four and a value of eight, right? Um, so uh, what will happen then is uh, we'll still have the current node and that'll be a listened object with a key of four and a value of eight and a next of none. Um, and so um, what we'll want to do is while the current node isn't, um, isn't or while the current node's next element isn't none, um, if the current node um, has the key that's uh, equivalent to the key that we're looking for in our get, uh, we return its value. Otherwise, we continue looping through. Um, so this won't even pass on the first run because um, we, we said that there's no there's only one list node there. So we'll go straight to here. Um, and if the current node's key um, isn't the key that we're looking for, we return negative one. Um, and this means that there's only one list node there, so we don't actually have to traverse through. Um, so I think in this case, uh, what we're looking for is a, a get of three, um, and there's only a four and uh, there's only one list node object there which has a four and uh, a key of four and a value of eight, um, and that key of four isn't obviously equivalent to the key three, so we'd return negative one. So I think it passes that scenario. Uh, do we want to go through maybe another scenario where there's um, multiple um, list node objects, um, like there was a collision previously in that bucket, or do you think we're okay? I think it's 120, so let's, let's maybe, I will do some commentary on in the interview and answer some questions about the interview in particular, and then I think For I'll sure. go into general questions as well that came out of this. Um, so goods and bads. Um, so as a whole, he approached the question correctly, right? We have an array of linked lists. Um, that is one way of doing it. He mentioned open and closed. Another way of doing this would be just an array. Um, I don't expect people to know open and closed hashing. If you have a solution that meets the runtime goals, I'm usually pretty happy. Um, sometimes towards the end, I'd have people compare open versus closed hashing and define what they are if folks didn't know what those were. So don't think that's an expectation. Um, the biggest thing here is actually just getting code with the correct design on the board. You notice as well, he made some mistakes and that does happen. But when he walked through them with examples, he found mistakes and fixed them. It's not a big deal to make mistakes. It is a bigger deal if I have to find them. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing that happened there. And that's much more realistic than writing a perfect solution the first time. Um, so that's, thank you for doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The other part of this is, uh, Fluid is a lot more of a talker. If you are not, that is okay. This was totally fine to do it this way. Um, the minimum amount that I need is an explanation up front of I'm going to do an array of linked lists because um, that basically gives me a chance to redirect you if you're kind of going in the wrong direction like Eddie was. Um, so stating kind of what you're doing up front gives me a chance to do that. If at that point um, when you're writing the code, you don't explain quite as much, it's okay. Um, do explain when you're making decisions. Um, in this question, for example, he chose 997 for the size and explained why he did that. A lot of times at that point, I would ask someone, could we take size as an input um, and discuss things like that. So when you have those decision points that are kind of critical to the question, that is something you also do need to talk about. If you just pick an arbitrary size, that's kind of problematic. And that's at the very least something I would circle back to. Um, so that, that's the biggest thing. If talking is distracting to you, that's why I want to give you kind of the minimum I need. Um, total silence obviously isn't going to work, but if you don't want to explain everything as you're writing it, is if the code can speak for itself as well. Um, other than that, usually at the end of this, I'd probably ask him some questions about his solution. Um, we'd go into more detail on size, that sort of thing. Another common mistake people make that he didn't make is forgetting about mod. That's a really common one. Um, the people will just take the output of the hash function and assume that it fits in their size. Um, so that's just a common mistake to point out. And most people will catch that on their way through. Uh, let's see, anything else? Any, any things you were trying to focus on, Fua, that you wanted to point out? Yeah, I think a big thing was like, yeah, like explaining decision points. I'm definitely a talker and 
Um, I'm like a talker in everything, not even just interviews. So that, that like makes sense. But yeah, um, I definitely encourage people to like, um, like not talk as much as I do because I personally benefit from, from talking a lot and like walking through my decision. I like just use it as like kind of a mind dump. Uh, that doesn't always work. Um, like there've been scenarios where I, I'm like going down the wrong route and I start talking about it. And because I'm talking about it, I get convinced it's the right route. So sometimes it's, it's important to like take a second. And obviously I knew this question, so it was a little bit inorganic, but like if sometimes it's important to take a second and like think it through on your own and then explain to somebody like, hey, I thought through this, but actually I realized that there's this wrong with it. So instead of doing that, I'm going to go down this path. And I didn't really do that in this interview, but I think that's important to know. Exactly. Yeah. So the uh, biggest point is just making sure you're discussing decision points and ma major design things that you're doing in code. And if there's more yep. you want, if you're comfortable talking more or less beyond that, that, that's kind of up to you, but that's the basics. All right. Um, let's see. Do people have questions they want me to answer about this, either technical or about interviewing in general? Julia can field those and read them to me because I think there'll be a lot. Oh, should yeah. I stop sharing my screen, by the way? Yeah, let's stop sharing. Or yeah, let's stop sharing. A little less pressure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, well, I think some of the questions, including some that I have, might be related to the code. So it might be good if um, we share just for a few more minutes, if that's okay with you. Um, I would say in general, what I would do um, beyond answering general questions, there's a lot of answers to this online. Um, so you can probably find a great solution if you look this up. Part of the reason I chose a question like this is because I thought you could probably find a really good answer to it. Um, so that that's the one thing I would encourage you to do is look up just look up a correct solution as well in addition to trying to code your own If the current key is equal to the key that you're looking for shouldn't you change the value or the key? Like how would you know when you're going through that linked list that you've landed on the right element? I Not remember the details of the code But in general with with hash functions if you're doing a put right and you hit a key that you're trying to put So if, you're, if you have two already in the list and it maps to one and then you try to put two, two in. There's an input, you have to make a choice there in what you want it to do. Overwrite is one choice. That is actually not what a lot of things do. A lot of libraries will throw. So those are two choices. You can do an overwrite, um, you can throw. Uh, there's, those are probably the two biggest ones. Um, there's some other things that you can think about doing, but, or you can leave it and say nothing. <laughs> so yeah, that's what we chose to do. We just return the none, but yeah, there's definitely a choice you can make. And as long as you like discuss that with the interviewer. I'm exactly, sure. that's a discussion point on where you decide what to do. And actually different languages do do that differently. Similarly, if you're implementing your own hash map, I'd hope you're doing that for a reason. And having a different desire, there is actually one reason you'd implement your own is that the built-in library wasn't doing the correct decision point there. Gotcha. Um, another question people had, what do you do if, you, if your hash map needs to be made larger? So that's expanding. I don't usually cover that in the interview. That's where a lot of times it's a good idea to pick the right one up front because when you have to expand, you basically have to remap everything. So you take the underlying array, usually double it in size. That's just an arbitrary thing. And then you basically have to go through every element already there and rehash it because you have to do the mod another time um, with the new size. Um, that's pretty expensive. That's actually why it's a good reason to be really careful thinking about the size of the hash map up front, because um, that operation can be pretty pricey. Most languages also allow you to specify the size you'd like, and so that's, unlike this one here, you basically just put in up front what size you want it, and then hopefully not double it, have to double it. Gotcha. Um, another question, do we need to define every concept we use in our solution? For, I guess uh, to give an example here with like linked list, I actually didn't need him to necessarily write out a linked list with like the next and stuff. I had him do it because it was nice, but if he had wanted to use the built-in one there, I probably would have let him as long as he could define what a linked list was um, and used it kind of the normal way. If he tried to use a linked list and did something that linked lists don't do, <laughs> that would be not great. Yeah, I think an important point here is like realize that you're being interviewed by like a senior software engineer or something like they understand what these districts are. You don't have to like yeah, as long as you're using a linked list in the normal way, I probably wouldn't question you. If you tried to do something crazy with it, I would be a little bit, <laughs> a little bit weary. Um, let's see. Okay, more questions. Can you explain further on the balance between talking and thinking like you had said earlier? So that really is per person. I mean, I think different interviewers have different preferences. I've been interviewing quite a long time, so I know that this is a lot of times just different people. Um, that's why I was trying to set the kind of minimum bar of talking. The minimum bar of talking is explaining the data structure you're going to use, the general layout of your, you know, your, what, your, what your solution is. And when you hit decision points, like the ones we've talked about explaining and asking, either asking the interviewer, 
you know, kind of which of these options should I choose or stating why you're doing what you're doing. Um, if you talk a lot, a lot, it sometimes can make the question go too slowly. So do be careful you're not talking so much that you can't actually write code fast enough. Um, so that, that's kind of the biggest thing to keep in mind there. If people talk a lot, a lot, we don't get through the question and that's a problem. Uh, but that's really the only issue with talking more. It's just that we don't get through the question. Gotcha. Um, one person asked if you could clarify a little bit more on the throw slash overwrite concept. Um, okay, I'll, I'll go through that again. So basically, if you already have an element in the list, let's say the key is two and the value is one, and then you try to do a put where the key is two and the value is two. The code can do one of two things at that point. It can either overwrite, and so instead of having two map to one, now two will map to two. Um, overwrite is an arbit that's an arbitrary choice. Another thing you could do there is your implementation could throw, and the error message would say something like key already present. I think that's actually probably one of the most common things to do. Another thing you could do, which is a super advanced route, which I never have anybody do, basically, is then you could have you could have a linked list of values. So you could have two mapped to a linked list that had one and two in it. Um, there's probably more things you could do. Those are probably the three most common. Throwing being the single most common. Um, Foo out here returned none. That was another thing. It's just you have to make a choice on what you want to do with that. And that depends on what your hash map use case is if you're doing this in the real world. Um, okay, do you value the thought process more than solving the solution? I need to have code that functions. That is the base thing. If you can't write code, we can't have you do a job. But after that, then, then thinking is more important. Um, having every detail right in the code is probably a little less important than understanding it. But if you can't write code, I mean, that is the job. So that is kind of the basic requirement. That being said, we don't need you to be master coder. I just want to be clear on that. You need to be a reasonable coder. If we hire you, I don't want to teach you the basics of Python sort of thing. So, Do you have to use a linked list when designing a hash map? No, that is the closed hashing thing. So that's if you want to just use an array. That's a whole other thing. Um, I was hoping we'd have time for it, but I think we're hitting towards the end. So that's something I'd encourage people to look up. Closed hashing is actually a good reason to write your own. Closed hashing has some really great benefits in terms of if you, your OS wants to cache things, then you don't go all over memory with a linked list. Um, so there'll be more details on that online, but closed hashing is actually also a great solution depending on what you want out of your hash map. Awesome. Well, we are out of time here. So I want to say thank you so much to everyone who came um, and participated. Thank you, Emily, for being our fantastic interviewer and providing lots of great insight and advice. Um, thank you, Eddie and Vlad, for uh, being our interviewees.